overview uh, over some of the machine learning methods um, and then go in more in depth with the k-means clustering, decision trees, random forests, then cover the Spark ML lib and the Spark ML. Uh, and finally, we'll go over the lab itself. So the idea that I have for this session, and it's slightly experimental, is rather than go into a specific method such as linear regression that everybody seems to be going into online, and that you can watch multiple YouTube videos, I, I wanted to give a more of a overview of some of the methods that have been categorized and I look at different categorizations. So this will give you a mindset, a, a tool set of, of sorts of how to go about and learn more on your own in the future. So let's go a little bit over some of the data science examples. I know that um, you know, everybody says like what is machine learning, what is machine learning is not. So I wanted to go over some of the examples that I believe qualifies machine learning, and I'll point out some that might not necessarily, might be some more argument regarding that. So let's start with PageRank. PageRank being very popular, you know, all of you that use Google search, you will have different web pages and they're ordered in a certain way. That's where PageRank algorithms come in. On the right side, you'll have uh, the Google News, and that's more of a clustering by topic. Spam detection, uh, whether your email has spam or it doesn't have spam. Very, uh, there's a variety of very interesting machine learning methods to do just that. Of course, precision medicine, machine learning is powerfully used in precision medicine. I mean, you've heard during the keynotes, some of the speaker who spoke about how they're using machine learning and accelerate data science to extract information from the underlying data and create knowledge. That's all about building knowledge at this point from all this data so you can make better machine learning decisions and that from that point on move on to do what's called more of a predictive medicine which is a hot hot term used nowadays even by uh, President Obama. DNA sequencing, we've seen uh, multiple companies come about you know, DNA sequencing. Uh, that's becoming a big area. Um, of, of, of research and with big data we have powerful machines to process some of these DNA sequencing, sequences. Um, a colleague of mine actually who had a brain tumor, he, uh, he processed his own DNA sequence to find out or to try to find out how could he pre prevent that from spreading in the future. Um, he paid about $15,000 for that sequence. I've heard the price have been dropping even farther since then. Um, and what's interesting is that the compressed data of that sequence is about 300 gigabytes on a hard drive, uncompressed over 600 gigabytes. So you need these uh, big machines and, and, and sophisticated algorithms to actually process data and extract some of that knowledge for clustering. So deep learning, I've had some arguments whether deep learning is part of machine learning or whether it is not. I kind of throw it in there. But more so because, you know, I always think that putting cats and dogs, uh, you know, in a slide is, is kind of cool and gets people, grabs people's attention. Um, whether, you know, autonomous cars, on the left you got your Google car, uh, on the right you got a car that I actually worked on back in 2007, that's for the Urban DARPA Challenge. Um, some machine learning methods, yes. Others, you know, you could classify, well, these are not exactly machine learning methods, it goes a little bit beyond. Not going to argue with that. Advanced AI, uh, you know, you've seen uh, iRobot, Ex Machina, and the uh, NASA Android that we're sending to space. This is a little bit higher level, and uh, of course, this is extrapolating machine learning. Um, we might leave it as that, but I just thought there's another cool picture over here, a uh, cool slide. Uh, you know, you're one thing that will go into AI, and if that interests you, uh, you know, we need uh, what a lot of people say, a theory of the brain. Once we have that theory of the brain, well, then we can do some more interesting AI, right? So we got all this data right now. Again, it's all about this, having this big data, but not having a theory, kind of like we do have a theory in physics. So once you have that theory, what we might be able to do is actually be like, well, do this data fit in that theory and do tests and, you know, have hypotheses, and et cetera. And of course, let's end just this, um, this preview with 
like sending AI, sending machines into space, colonizing the galaxy, right? That's the big thing. That's the ultimate one. Uploading your brain and sending it out there. I know this is extrapolating way too far, but I hope it kind of got you interested. And now let's go a little bit down level. Let's go uh, down to what machine learning is all about and how does, how does machine learning fit into the data science process. So I found this. I found this was really cool. Um, it's like what a data scientist should be. Um, you know, he should be able to run a regression, run a SQL query, scrap a website, design an experiment, pretend to understand deep learning. I guess a lot of people say, oh, yeah, deep learning, right? That is really cool. But a lot of them don't exactly know what deep learning is. So you know, if you can pretend what deep learning is, you're on your way to being a data scientist. You steal from D3Gallery, D3JS, got a lot of um, phenomenal uh, graphical tools to, to graph all your data. You better know how to argue R versus Python. You know, there's always a hot debate, and I'm still debating about that myself. Think in MapReduce, uh, I don't know. Well, you, you should be able to think in MapReduce, you know how the data is being parallelized. Um, let's see, clean up messy data, data munging, oh, definitely test up hypothesis. You should be able to talk to a business person as a data scientist, at least be able to explain it, you know, so they could relate. Uh, script the shell, hack a p value, seeing, you know, how extreme that value is compared to your statistical model. Of course, you should machine learn a model. That should be part of you being a data scientist. And of course, we like to claim that in the end, specialization is just for engineers. So here's a higher level overview of this predictive analytics prerequisites, this process that you would, uh, you would engage on, you would uh, start before you would actually do or you would actually train your model, right? And this is very important. Some people point me out, Robert, you have not talked about this process before, and a lot of people think that you just jump in and process the data right away. Well, there's a little bit more to it, right? Well, first of all, that, let me see if I can use my laser point over here. Uh, barely visible, but this top box over here, this, well, maybe, how about my mouse? Does my mouse still work here? Ah, there we go. So if you can't read this, this, all it says is, what is the question I'm answering? So what is the question I'm answering? What is it that we're trying to find here? And this is the first step to doing any kind of machine learning, to design these, um, to design these models. And then this one says, what data will I need? So now you're looking at discovering all the data, grabbing all the data, seeing what kind of data sets you can grab your hands on, and then viewing it. So single view allows you to bring all the data. What they mean is bring all the data and start having all these visualizations looking at the data in one place. This is a nice big square. I guess it's not a black box anymore, um, but it's a essentially predictive analytics gray box that will uh, well, this is an octagon, right? One, two, three, uh, or sexagon. Okay. Uh, we'll go into this one in a minute. Um, so once you do this predictive analytics, then what you would do is you would review your results. You would share your findings with your colleagues. And in the end, you would finish. And by finishing, well, you could do two things, or you could do both of them. On one hand, you could generate um, and create a report, or, of course, you could deploy uh, your model into production. So here's looking a little more into like what this, uh, what we've seen in this predictive uh, analytics box before. Um, the resolution I know isn't the best, but bear with me. So now that you have, you've kind of designed, you've got your plan of what you're going to be doing. Uh, the next step is actually acquiring the data. You know, you got, you hook up everything, so you're bringing all the data, you're acquiring all the data. Um, and of course, the very important process of actually cleaning the data, right? Let me even look at, just to make sure I read all these properly. Uh, so in this square, this one, all it says, you analyze the data quality. Well, you want to make sure that the data is of good quality, and that's part of cleaning the data. And, um, and right here is all about reformatting the data. So you format the data, you structure data. So if you had unstructured data, you want to structure data. You want to put it in maybe a JSON format. You want to put it in the data frame format. And then you start using the data. And then you push it up to analyzing this data. Um, and 
you know, you evaluate the results on one, and you create these models, right? And so, well, first of all, you create the model, then you evaluate the result, um, and then you create features. And this is the cyclical, they all feed each other. Uh, then you can push some of the data out that you've already generated that might influence, for example, you've done uh, k-means clustering, you found some clusters, you push it back, now you have some more insight, and now you have uh, more things you can take. And here's some of the tools that are listed. Um, of course, if you used Hive or Pig, or you'll be processing the data in such a way, um, and then you know, here's a, just two different languages, languages listed, whether it's Python or R, but as you can see, Spark is pretty much everywhere we're here in this process. And as you finish, you know, you might have other tools. You might use Spark, Spark Streaming for near all-time data. You might be having Storm for you know, real-time data. And of course, if you're using Zeppelin, you could be prototyping your notebooks there. You could be evaluating. You could be running your programs. You could be calling um, your, your, your programs that are in Zeppelin notebook via REST services um, from, from other parts of, uh, of your uh, of your company, for example. So, what data science is and what it is not. <clears throat> so, machine learning, as you can see, only encompasses these top circles. On one hand, the orange one is like, well, if you have this computational thinking, if you can do hacking, and if you have the math and statistics, well, this is machine learning. Um, Andrew and G, and, and similarly, if you go on Wikipedia, it's essentially a science of how computers learn without being explicitly programmed. Uh, but if you add the expertise, if you have the expertise in your domain, well, suddenly you are the data scientist. You are the data scientist for biotech companies. You're the data scientist for you know, Twitter doing sentiment analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Now you are the expert. Now you are the data scientist. You have all these circles together. So let's go over some of the machine learning methods. And again, I'm not going to dig deep into those. I just wanted to provide a bit of an, uh, overview, an uh, overview. This is more of an umbrella of uh, machine learning methods, some of the categories. We'll go more in depth in two of them. But let's just start with what is out there. So when you go after this crash course and start exploring um, the Spark machine learning libraries on your own, you'll be able to fit your ideas, the categories that I'll present, and be like, oh, this is part of this, this is part of that. Now it makes more sense. So before we do, um, popular terms, what is supervised versus unsupervised learning? And you'll hear that a lot. But essentially, and I think this is the, the, the easiest way to explain it, supervised by having a known result, having examples that are labeled, and unsupervised learning, examples that have not been yet labeled. Other way of looking at it, you know, in supervised learning, you could distinguish, well, we have these circles and we have these axes, and we know um, what the result should be, what we're looking for. And in unsupervised learning, another definition is, well, these are all the variables or all the sets that are labeled with the same. So they're all labeled as circles. So we don't know exactly what to expect. So how about classification, or identifying which category an object belongs to? And uh, you know, right here we have a random force, which we'll cover more in deeply, but essentially it's a combination and uh, aggregating the results from different decision trees. This is the k nearest neighbor. It's a uh, supervised in the sense that, well, let's go exactly what goes on here. So we have these two circles actually taken from Wikipedia. Uh, if you consider the inner circle, the non-dashed line, the solid line, uh, you have examples. And those examples are already classified. You have either triangles or you have squares. And if you just consider that space, the radius within that solid line, and ask yourself, where, where does that green circle, this unknown, belong to, this new object, right? You'll be like, well, it definitely belongs into the red triangles. But what ha because we have two red triangles within that space. But what happens if we expand it, and now we have this dashed line? Well, suddenly, if you look at it, we have three squares versus uh, two red triangles. So at this point, you would classify it 
the green circle as belonging to the blue squares. So what I'm trying to do is this is a very high level intuitive feel for it because what I found is a lot of people you know talk about different methods but when you go in deep they don't have that intuitive. So I'm trying to explain this intuitive feel for some of these methods and what you can do with them. What about regression or most commonly linear regression you have this uh, curve, straight curve in this uh, example that essentially you're fitting for all these data points, data points, and it's, you know, it's a continuous fit, right? And there's many, many applications that you can do just with linear regression. It's a very popular method, and most introductory classes will just focus on linear regression because you can do so many different things, uh, you know, such as detecting drug responses or trying to predict the stock prices. Well, what about clustering? or essentially grouping or finding uh, sets or clusters. Um, for example, if you're using k-means clustering, in this case, you would be looking for, you would know before that, that you know, you're looking for uh, three uh, different sets, three different clusters, and in this case, you would have three different clusters that would resolve, the green, the blue, and the red. What about LDA or topic modeling, where you're clustering your text around certain topics? This is very useful if you're trying to find like what topics, uh, where does this document belong to, right? Which class uh, of topics this document belongs to? What about collaborative filtering? This one's actually very useful, um, and especially using the alternating least squares method. So you have your users and your movies. This could be your IMDB, for example, profile, or, or, or your Netflix profile, or your Amazon movies. And now you, you're trying to predict, well, based on the movies that I've seen um, and, uh, and the other users in these matrix with basically filling out the spots, what is the likelihood that I'm, uh, I'm going to have you know, other movies that I would also like? And based on that, you know, Amazon or Netflix, they can recommend a certain set of movies. And it's also a very popular method, a lot of resources online talking just on how to even you know, manually implement from the beginning to the very end this ALS algorithm. Deep learning approach, ah, you know, some people say you're not really machine learning, but essentially, you know, you have these neural nets, you train them, and there you've got back propagation, and again, you train and deploy, and you find either a cat or a dog. Dimensionally reduction, and this one is uh, valuable. So you're trying to reduce the number of variables that you're trying to consider. Um, you know, it could be principal component analysis, uh, where you're looking at where is the most variation in, in the data. And on one hand, you would find, uh, you know, core dimension, dimension number one being where the data is most variable. This would be dimension number one and dimension number two. Or you, you're using TS and E for reducing the space and say you have, you know, high dimensionally data and you try to map it to a three or two dimensional space. Pre-processing is very, very uh, important in this data science process. You're ex essentially trying to extract certain features. You try to normalize the data. Some of the algorithms that you will use only will work with normalized data. So that's a very important pre-processing step. And again, as a data scientist, you will need to, uh, you're not only running machine learning algorithms. There's this entire process that takes you from cleaning the data, maybe you got help with cleaning the data, uh, and then, you know, modifying the data such that it's relevant for algorithms so that they can actually work. So, for example, you know, here you're converting certain words and mapping them into a vector space. Um, and then, of course, model selection. This is a very important part where, you know, you're comparing different parameters that you use in models um, and you're using different methods uh, such as grid search to find the optimal set of parameters that would, uh, that would help your algorithm move, move forward and would optimize and make it better. Um, of course, not all the features are relevant or not all the features actually produce the best models. You may find that you know, with, within a larger feature set, only a subset of those features are relevant. So now you're going to be looking like, well, maybe all out of, out of these 20 features, we're going to use eight features. And then there are different methods that you can do to actually distinguish uh, which features are relevant more so than others. Some will come up and say, well, out of 120 features, we've used 20 features. And then you ask, well, 
how did you choose those 20 features, right? And there are methods to do so, but we're not going to cover those in this session. Uh, but then again, you go, you generate a subset of those features, you run your learning algorithms, and you test its, perf and you test its performance. Um, sometimes what you might do is you might create a model that is too complex, and it's overfitting in the data on one hand, or it's underfitting, and it's too inaccurate. So again, there's, there's a balance, there's this artsy aspect to being data scientists, where as you work more with the data, as you run these different machine learning algorithms, you start to find out like, what is, what is the optimal, uh, optimal set uh, of parameters that I should be using uh, to neither underfit or overfit. So let's go into the Spark machine learning library. This is a core overview, um, a high-level view of what is in the Spark machine learning library. Whether you're going about you know, basic statistics, um, classification and regression, collaborative filtering, clustering, dimension and reduction, feature extractors and transformers. I'll cover later what that exactly means. But for this session, I wanted to focus on decision trees uh, and uh, ensemble methods such as the random forest and the k-means clustering. Um, decision trees um, will cover why and why, of course, k-means are relevant and why I wanted to present them and get you engaged with using those two methods during the hands-on portion of the lab. So k-means clustering being an unsupervised method, why would you care? Well, it is a simple and very fast algorithm to find clusters. It is commonly used to, um, to find anomalies in your set. So for example, you'll be looking just for one. You know that there's just one cluster. And then if you know that there are uh, points that are lying outside of that, that cluster, that will be the ana anomaly that you would detect. Of course, there are drawbacks, such as you know, it doesn't work too well with nonlinear clusters. And you should know what, uh, what the cluster number is beforehand. Strong sensitivity to outliers and some noise. And perhaps, you know, there's, uh, it, it's not that good of, of overcoming uh, local optimum. But I'm not going to go into details. So these are some of the drawbacks. But the core thing, it's simple, it's fast, and it's easy to understand. And it's very good for uh, anomaly detection, which might be very useful in you know, IT settings where you're trying to find if, if something's going wrong with your system. So how does k-means work? Uh, well, in this instance, uh, we, we pick three cluster centers. We sort of, in this case, knew what the, what the cluster centers would be. And there's, you know, there's a whole debate of how do you specify how many clusters there are, you know, what are the methods. When I going to get into that uh, in, in this session. But say we choose those three cluster centers. And uh, once we, uh, and they were chosen randomly, this k wide through k3. The next step is we assign these points to um, to, you know, to, to the nearest cluster center. So the green ones, the closest ones uh, are to the K1, the red ones are closest to K2, and the blue points are closest to K3. And then, um, you know, we move the cluster centers to the mean of each cluster. And we continue doing that until there's converges that, convergence has been achieved, and these clusters no longer move. So here's a very short uh, animations with uh, four clusters. As you can see, it's moving the cluster centers and recalculating the mean. And once it achieves the convergence, it will stop. And it repeats. So here's an example of, um, you know, when you look at the uh, Zeppelin notebook, demos that are in your main directory after uh, you run the sandbox today, you will find one of the demos is a crime analysis demo from one of the previous keynotes of Hadoop Summit. And, uh, and actually, part of that demo used k-means clustering. So here's a map of San Francisco. And part of the demo was to find you know, what, is the, what, are, what are the crime rates at different neighborhoods in San Francisco. So we knew beforehand that there are 37 uh, neighborhoods in San Francisco. Um, we've, we've mapped them now, we drew the boundaries. You know, these actually, these shades uh, reflect, uh, you know, the, the incidence of, of, of criminal reports that have 
um, have occurred. But the more interesting part, and why we're focusing on k-means, is that then we ran the k-means algorithm with 37 clusters, and it was properly able to detect all the different centers based on the data and then the features that we've, we've supplied. So this is just another example of what you could use k-means um, in, 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 in any kind of demos or examples or, or proof of concepts that you're, that you're running this on. So in the, uh, in the actual notebook, in the actual lab today, you will find, you know, we basically supply you with uh, two different sets, and you run the algorithm, and ultimately, you should be able to, your algorithm should find the centers of these two clusters. As you can see, it's a very simple, it's just, uh, you know, vectors in three-dimensional space, and you're trying to find the center of, of, of those clusters. So it should be a very simple way of looking at the data and then coming up and, and verifying that your algorithm worked correctly based on the known outcome because it's very simple. So let's go a little bit about decision trees and random forest. Um, again, that's part of a supervised learning. Um, you're, you're classifying the outputs and you're classifying, so you could classify under zero or ones, or you know, there, there could be more classification um, outcomes that, that you would you would, you would have by using those methods. Um, so why a decision tree? Well, decision tree and why I choose it. I think decision trees more so than, than uh, any other methods and perhaps, you know, k-means, it's, it's very easy to understand. It's very easy to interpret and, of course, explain to executives, which is very important. So you run this decision tree. I'm going to be like, well, sir, you just take a look at all these trees, how they branch you should be able to understand it, right? There's basically these if and the, then statements and it's branching and I'll show you a really cool visualization shortly why using such visualizations is actually very important to convincing that your algorithm works and it has value. Requires little preparation, uh, which is also very important. Um, so it doesn't require normalization. Uh, you don't have to create dummy variables um, and, uh, and uh, you don't have to remove, uh, and you don't need to create, you know, remove the blank values. Um, and on top of it, it performs well with large data sets. Uh, so that's also very important because, you know, as your data grows, you can run these algorithms and they all perform well. So here's an example that I wanted to go through because I found this to be uh, a very interesting visualization. And, um, and the, if, you're f if, if you're new to decision trees, uh, this, is, this is phenomenal in going through what they actually are and giving you an example. So let me go full screen here. Um, don't, don't, don't. Oh, let me just get to this button. All right. Hopefully you can all see this at this point. So we're going to be trying to detect in this example. By, by the way, how many of you have seen this before? Three people. Excellent, excellent. So this is a public website. This is when, when, when I got uh, introduced to uh, machine learning with, uh, and especially I wanted to check out like, what decision trees actually are and are they actually useful? And I was like, well, this is actually pretty neat. So what we're trying to do is determine, uh, based on some data that we have, could we automatically determine where a, a house belongs? Does it belong to San Francisco or does it belong to New York City? And New York City is, uh, are, are those, is it's this data on the right. So, you know, one way to look at it is like, well, you know, where are the houses placed? Are they above 240 feet? So the highest house, and you know, you could just look at you know, how hilly the environment is, is about 240 feet. So you could classify your houses or, or your skyscrapers or whatever that is based on where are they placed. But if you do so, you would be also classifying uh, all these houses in San Francisco that are uh, placed over here. So now you gotta, you got to have another step. We're like, well, let's, let's add some nuance. And how about we also include you know, the price per square foot? So once you in include the price per square foot and the height, now we have so some better classification. Now you, ha you have less data that overlaps. And you can be like, well, with now with greater accuracy, we can say, well, these houses belong to San Francisco, whereas these houses belong to New York City. So then you start drawing all these boundaries, and you start adding more categories. So now you can add elevation, your build, number of bathrooms, bedrooms, the price, square per foot, and, par and price per square foot. 
So decision trees are really good at finding these boundaries automatically. So again, you basically learn a model, and it figures out in a recursive way. Here's, here's another way of looking at the data. So again, as, as a data scientist, you, know, you want to look at the data from different angles. You want to look at the data. Uh, you want to move the data around, play with the data around. So it's not just you know, plug and play. Uh, so here we're moving data in a different, in a, and we're using histograms to detect and see that actually most of the houses are nowhere as high. Let's see, where is the 240 foot point? Nowhere as high uh, on, on the 240 foot point. I guess this would be the last point right here. Um, uh, you know, most of the houses actually far on a far lower than. Uh, than 240 feet. And what that means is that you know, we can draw better boundaries just based on that knowledge. So on one hand, you have this pie chart. You could classify if, if we have just this cutoff. This is just one simple cutoff. So it's, if it's taller than 240 feet, well, let's classify them in San Francisco. If it's less than two, 240 feet, let's classify it as New York City. So with just that point, we'll be like, well, you have you know, 111 houses are in New York City, 92 in San Francisco. And here, all of them would, of course, belong to San Francisco because that's our cutoff point. So what happens if we move that cutoff point to zero? Well, if we have zero, then all of them will classify, well, here's you know, only 111 in New York and 139 in San Francisco. And there's this false negative misclassification. So at this point, your algorithm would be only 56% correct versus when you had the first line of you know, 240 feet, and your algorithm or your model will be 63% correct. So they go on, and, uh, and I have a link in, in the docs, uh, and basically say, well, if, if we use the recursion, we find that the, you know, there's the best split. i um, not sure what, the, what they came up with, but there's a best split. Oh, yeah, 92 feet. And if you use that split, and the machine learned where that best split is, you're going to have a much better accuracy. So just from that one split, just based on the height being 92 feet, you would have a much better accuracy of about 82%. So you keep adding all these different points, like elevation, your build, bathrooms, price, square footage, and price per square foot, and you start growing this tree. So this is the most important split. This is the very first branch. This is basically an if and then statement. And all of these are if and then statements. And the machine learning at this point, the, the, creating this decision tree, grows it and adds all these different categories. So it eventually, it adds you know, the pricing, square footage, et cetera. And all this data is flowing through. And now that we've trained it, we should verify it that actually all of this data has been trained properly. So we should have 100% accuracy because this is all this data uh, that we, I mean, we've only used this trained set. So as you can see, we've, we've got all this data through this decision tree. So basically, it's all these things coming through and being split and then different splits depending on what features that data contains. And now to verify it, of course, this is you have to verify your model. Well, let's use the other set of the data, so actually to check the reality. So now you're using the actual data that, had, that the model hasn't been trained on. And once you flow through all of this, you'll find that there's almost 90% accuracy, right? So pretty good. There's some misclassification here of you know, having San Francisco houses classified as New York and vice versa, having some New York houses classified as being in San Francisco. So let's go back to the presentation. Correct, correct. So the first, so the question was, was the first data the trained data set? Yes. So we've trained the model, and then we ran the other. So we split the data into, into two sets. One part of that set was training the model, and the other one that we ran in the end to actually check the actual accuracy with the rest of the data was the data that the model has been trained on to see what is the accuracy with the data that the model uh, hasn't seen before. So now that you've seen a decision tree, I thought, well, I could also squeeze in and introduce the random forest. And the reason why is because it's just combining the results of different trees. Um, and the idea is that you know, instead of using a, a decision tree with, uh, that, that is really deep, we could use trees that are shallower, that are simpler to build. But combining their outputs, we're going to get a better result overall. So on one hand, you would see here, here are the results of 
uh, you know, what the decision tree would classify. But if you want some more nuance, you know, you, you have multiple trees, and then this classification is more nuanced to, to the end result. As you can see, the boundaries that are being drawn with random forest are not as sharp. There's more variability. The, the colors are, are smoother in this very simple, again, intuitive example. Another one is why ensembles, or in this case, specifically random forest works, is you're overcoming limitations of, of, a, of a single hypothesis. You know, you have these harsh um, boundaries drawn when you just train on a decision tree versus when you have this model and you average these models by having ensembles, it's much smoother. So this is the actual data set. So I was like, well, let's make this interesting. Let's uh, use an actual data set. So this is a uh, diabetes data set, and we're going to use, in the lab itself, we're going to use the uh, decision trees and random forest and see what the accuracy is when you actually run these models and train on that data. This is an actual data set um, that's been sanitized. And you can see, again, this is a supervised, so I try to highlight. So it's either a negative one or a plus one, depending on you have diabetes or you not. And this data set contains a total of eight features. For a machine learning model, again, it doesn't really matter what those features represent. We want to just go and train it and let it figure out with, well, here's some data that we've trained this data set on, and now we're going to use the rest of the data to see how accurate it is in predicting uh, you know, future data um, and, and predict the accuracy by using other data that the model has been trained on. So let's go over machine learning in Spark. For those of you that took my class yes, uh, I'm sorry, on Tuesday, uh, it's been long the last two days, um, you know, we've covered the Spark core and a little bit of Spark SQL. Here we're going to focus on the machine learning part. So before I go in, so there's two things that you will see, and that might be slightly confusing if it's your first time with machine learning Spark. You have the MLlib and the Spark ML. So the MLlib is the original lower API that has been developed. A bit like RDDs that have been developed initially, that's the first step of parallelizing the data. You know, MLlib has been developed uh, initially and it's been built on top of RDDs. That's what they all had to, uh, had, uh, had um, at their disposal. And with Spark 2.0, which is at, in a tech preview right now, it's gonna start and it's gonna be put into maintenance mode. And the reason why is because now you have Spark ML, which is a higher, it's a newer level uh, API, and it's been designed to actually construct the flows. Um, and if, again, if you've been in my session, you will recall that when you use data frames, there's a lot of optimizations underneath. So data frames are higher level than RDDs, so that speeds up things as well because it uses a catalyst optimizer underneath to translate the data frames code, again, into RDDs, but that's removed from you, so it makes all these optimizations and it's actually faster. So all of the algorithms, if you see, not all of them have been written into Spark ML just yet, the newer higher level API, but they're working on it. So if there are other algorithms that you still need to use that haven't been implemented, you can of course go and just use the MLIP. They're performance-wise, they're exactly the same. Yes, sir. Um, the SQL database that I just So can we talk about random forest afterwards? Okay, at, at the end of the session. So I'll go through and then we'll go back and we can talk details about random forest. So I wanted to touch again, th because this is a data scientist and I think this doesn't get stressed enough, um, stressed enough of what is the actual process that you go through um, when, you design, uh, when you design a model. So again, you know, we've, we've covered this, but this is a, a different way of looking at it. You have all your data, you have all your data items and in this case, because it's a supervised model, you have these labels that indicate what the result should be. And you, know, you, you might extract some features. So now you have, say, a feature set that you're going to be using, a subset of features, perhaps. You will then train the model and actually create the model. So this skips a few, few parts of you know, data cleansing, et cetera, et cetera. But once you have the model, now what you're doing is you're trying to predict of you know, using that model to get the data to see what is the result from, uh, from running through in, in real life examples. So this is the prediction step. 
So you would use that model, you know, you would, again, have the data coming in, if it's the prediction step in real life. Uh, you would, again, extract the features, there'll be another step that, that you would pass, and then that model would actually do the prediction. And it would give you a label, so basically saying, well, now we've used all this other data, and now our resulting label should be either, well, you have diabetes, or you don't have diabetes in our specific example. So here's SparkML. Here's the actual pipeline. So the whole idea is that now you're building this pipeline of things that will happen. Uh, so just as I've shown you that green box, which is basically a, a feature extractor, now you would put these feature extractors here, number one or number two, whatever they are. You could have more, or you could have just one. Then probably you want to combine the features, and in the end, you're running the actual random forest algorithm. So um, in, in this pipeline, you, know, you would input this data frame. You would actually train this pipeline. And then you would, uh, you would, you would have the output model would, that would actually, the pipeline model that you've built, that you've created. And then you would use that for prediction. So that's, that's, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's be a little more specific. So in the Spark ML case, I've looked at the documentation. I'm like, so what is the easiest way to explain it? And there are really two methods that you should pay attention to. And you use the fit method for training, and you would use the transfer method for prediction. And I think that should explain everything if there was any confusion whatsoever that you had before. So again, into, in, in our example, you have your pipeline uh, that you've created, right? You could have, you know, uh, feature extractor one, feature extractor two, combining features, run, run forest. You would use the fit method, and now you've trained your model. And the next step is, well, now we want to use that train model, that, that pipeline that we've created. So now let's apply transform method to actually get predictions uh, on the data that's coming in. In the code itself, this is what it would look like. Uh, you have, you know, you have your pipe uh, that you would fit on the training data, your training model. And now for results, you would have, you would apply the transform function on the test data to actually verify and see what's the accuracy of your model. So in the code, let's go a little bit more about random forest. Um, there, there's a few things that are, you don't really need to consider. You're like you need to, um, you know, you could just look at the, we have the indexers, the parsers, the hashing transformer, the vector assembler. We're not going to get into details what exactly they are, but I just wanted to show you in the code of how you would put them in this pipe, uh, in, this, in this pipe that you would create with Spark ML. So, what would happen here is, you know, in, in orange I've highlighted, you would train your, uh, you, you would create your random forest classifier. You would specify, well, I want to use about 100 trees. So as you recall, the random forest just uses, uses the simple trees that you would com combine together. But the more interesting part is now creating this pipeline is basically putting all of these together. So again, like I've shown you before, this pipeline that you would combine, you would get all of these things and in the end, you would apply the random forest uh, to, train, to, train those, uh, to train those models. So again, you would use this pipe.fit and pipe.transform. And that's really the essential part of running Spark ML. So now let's go a little bit of Apache Zeppelin. For those of you who have been, you, know, you already know what Zeppelin is. But for those of you who have been in my session before, we're going to use this web-based notebook. Um, and, it's, and it's great for, you know, any kind of data exploration, discovery. Uh, if you used Jupyter before, you, this should seem very similar. It's just 100% open source with, uh, with additional things such as, you know, pluggable interpreters and being able to run multiple codes within, so whether it's R and Python and Scala within the same notebook, right? So that's something where these extensions uh, give you more flexibility. And on top of that, uh, besides having these, uh, these very nice visualizations, you can pass the variables using what's called Zeppelin context between the different paragraphs. So you could have a user put, uh, or a data scientist, or a data analyst write piece of code in R, and then you know another one would be grabbing in Python or Scala. So now you're not limiting yourself to just having developers in one language. You could use multiple language within the same notebook, and that's where this this powerful thing comes in. And of course, what I also wanted to uh, to stress is, uh, you know, you have these pluggable interpreters, so now you can bring in your code, you can just use execute shell commands to run something like wget, grab a data set, put it in your sandbox that you'll be playing with later on. Um, you know, 
then you would, you would actually run, you, whether it's Scala code or R or Python, using Spark and, and start building different models. Yes? Yes, so for, for, for just, 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 just a quick question. So the question was, does it require Spark on a machine? Yes, so in the sandbox itself, we got Spark and a few other tools, and Zeppelin is already pre-configured. So that's the beauty of it. So I, I can explain a little bit more on that. Um, just a brief preview. This is how the Zeppelin will look in the near future. Uh, so it's gonna, the, the remodeling the EU one, so it's gonna be even more beautiful than it is right now. Um, and some of you might, you know, so how do we, how do we export these models? Uh, there's something that's called predictive model markup language. That's one way to export your models. And here's a, here's a brief list of some of the methods that you can export. Um, there's also, if, if you find and look online, um, I've grabbed the slide from uh, Spark Summit. You know, you can also export it to what's called MLeap. And, uh, and the architecture looks essentially like this. So you train machine learning pipeline in Spark and then export it to MLeap. And then you can apply in this MLeap for production. So if you have questions on that, then you can follow up and look up more uh, information on that. Or we could talk afterwards of what it means to actually export and productize all these machine learning models. If you need additional resources, there's plenty of resources online, whether it's Coursera with uh, you know, machine learning class with Andrew NG, or you have EDX classes, um, you know, scalable intro to machine learning, introduction to statistics. And of course, we have uh, a lot of classes at the Hortonworks University that have multi-day, uh, the whole week of actually going deeply, uh, you know, even, even more deep than, than we did here, step by step of explaining all those different concepts and even more hands-on sessions. So let's go and overview the lab. So this will be a very high level overview. Um, and then once everyone gets up and running, I'll, I'll have another overview where we go uh, more in depth of, uh, of what's actually going on. So this is, uh, let me zoom in. So this is, Yes, 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 I'll show the link again in a moment. Let me just go very briefly and then I'll, I'll put the link uh, on the side. I just wanted to go very high level. So this is, this is the Lab 201 that you'll be running today. There's a brief introduction. Um, it's written in Scala, um, but the Scala syntax in these notebooks is very similar to the Python uh, syntax, so you should not have any problems. If you need more information, there's a Scala tutorial link. Uh, some pre-checks that you run quick discussion about what k-means clustering is all about. Then you're actually doing, running a k-means clustering. Uh, here's some sample data that essentially you know, you're written down. So as, as you recall, those points in three-dimensional space, those are the exact same points. And you're just running and trying to find, can you identify those two clusters? And here's an image of preview of what they should be. And then we go, so again, k-means is an unsupervised method, and then we go into the supervised learning. Um, and then we download this diabetes data set. As you can see, you know, as I said, this is running a shell command within this notebook. You're previewing the, uh, the notebook using the, your typical shell commands. Um, then what you're doing is you know, you're building your decision trees with the MLib library. So Here's two things that I wanted to do. I wanted to show you, well, here first an, is a Spark MLlib library. This is the, the, the older one. This is the low level one. And next, once you run the decision trees, you know, you specify what's your next step, et cetera. Then I wanted to, to run the same thing with Spark ML. So now you could compare one to one. What's the difference between this older machine learning API to this newer machine learning API? And of course, if you run it, uh, you might find that there's a difference of accuracy, and the reason why uh, is because there's what, uh, it does a random split on the training and testing data. So if there's a slight variability after training, you know, training uh, decision tree of MLlib versus the Spark ML, it's because of this random sampling of the training and test data, just so you know. But under, underneath, those two algorithms run in the same way. I'll get to you in a moment. Um, so then what happens is we use random forest. So similarly now you're using ensemble methods. So I wanted, to, uh, wanted you to explore whether there's going to be a difference in results of you know, running a single decision tree versus running smaller multiple trees together and combining the results to get the final result in accuracy. And once you run that, I'm going to leave it to you to explore. That's it for the lab. So let me get back to 
that link, well, before I do, that link will get you here. So that tiny URL will get you to this spot. And all, all, all you need to do is you need to click this, this link over here that will take you to the tutorial. And um, here's the actual lab if you have already a Zeppelin space. Uh, and if you just want to import the notebook, notebook manually, use, uh, go to this link, import that notebook. By the way, here's my contact information if you want to add me on LinkedIn, if you want to follow me on Twitter. Here's that visual intro that I've been showing you before on decision trees. And I've listed additional resources here for you to explore. Um, let me double check one thing. So if you click that link over here, uh, okay. Yeah. So if you click that link, that will get you started. And basically, you get a tutorial how to set up your uh, sandbox, how to get your Zeppelin notebooks, um, and basically how to start your lab. So let me put that link up again. All right. So here's a tiny URL link. Please start doing that. I'll be walking around if you have any questions. And then I'll come back and go more in depth with, uh, over, over the lab itself.